All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of The Personal Collection. Today, we have Steve, who is a cricket collector from Australia. But first, I have to give a shout out to my friend, Jason Cards. He got me in contact with Steve and said he's one of the go-to guys in Australia for collectors. So thank you for putting this together. And thank you for being on. It's what, really early in the morning over there in Australia right now? Uh, just gone uh, nearly two o'clock in the afternoon here. Okay, so it's... Uh, 10 o'clock at night over here. So you guys can tell a little bit of a time difference, but Hey, thanks yep. again for jumping on here. I'm super excited to see some of your collection. No worries. So I'm looking forward to it myself. So how did you end up getting into cricket cards? I know like the American culture over here, a ton of people are into the baseball cards collected it throughout the fifties, sixties, and seventies got really popular. What was kind of like the cricket card culture over there in Australia? I guess I guess I started probably 20, 25 years ago uh, inheriting a box of tobacco tins from my grandfather when he passed away. And inside the tobacco tins were these little tiny little bits of cardboard with cricket figures on it that I knew from my pop talking to me about, you know, what he saw and who he saw growing up. And obviously he saw the greatest, in my opinion, one of the greatest sportsmen of the world play, Don Bradman play. And used to tell me stories about, you know, going to the MCG or going to the Sydney Career Crown or going to the Brisbane Career Crown and watching test matches between Australia and England. I opened these cards up in my sort of mid-20s and thought, well, I might see if I can find out where the rest of them are or how many there are in the set. One set led to another and led to another and led to another. And now I'm told I have one of the biggest collections of career cards anywhere in this country. Um, and... I guess that over the last 20 years, I've used a combination of my professional background in IT, as well as a love for the sport to further um, develop a database of information that has me as an inveterate researcher, do the research on the subjects, on the cards themselves, and then try and add to the collection, um, which is now got to this, it's now got to the stage where I don't even keep it on site anymore at home because it's so big that, um, and the concern is that there's been a couple of major thefts here. So I have my collection stored in an offsite vault and um, which I've got access to 24 seven. And I'll often be, you know, off in the building where the collection is at 11 o'clock at night, having got there during 11 o'clock in the morning when it was sun, sunny and looked out the window and all of a sudden it's dark. And I've been there for 12 hours, just working on different aspects of my collection without realizing the sun's gone down and I haven't eaten. So that's just what I do. Uh, the, it, it really got a kick along probably 15 years ago when I visited a friend who runs a retail shop here in Melbourne, who I purchased quite a few cards from, um, but he told me at the time that he and his wife were going on a holiday to Queensland and the shop would be closed for two weeks. So I just assumed they were away for two weeks and that was it. But the day he arrived back, I accidentally just as a pure fluke of timing, wound up at his shop again. And he said to tongue in cheek, you must smell these things. And I said, what do you mean? He said, stick your head out the back door and you'll know what I mean. And I put, put my head out the back door of the shop and here was his um, four wheel drive with a tandem trailer full of plastic tubs, big, you know, the big large storage tubs on it. And I said, what's in that? And he said, the largest card collection I've ever purchased. And I went to Queensland for two weeks to pick it up, catalog it and bring it home again. You're the first person to see it. And I thought to myself, wow, if he's bringing this into his shop as stock to resell and no one else knows it's here, I've got an opportunity perhaps if I jump in quickly to get the cream off the top and uh, work my way through it. So I said to him, I, at that stage I'd sold a property and I was contemplating um, buying a sports car or another sports car. I had one before that and uh, I was contemplating kind of buying another one. I said to him, if I came back every day for the rest of the week, would you allow me exclusivity into the collection and not tell anyone else it was here? He said, well, I can't unpack everything in a week. So you've got a week before I get to the weekend and I start unpacking everything and putting it all away. So I think I gave myself about 30 to 40,000 Australian dollars to spend on a sports car. And I thought, well, I'm not looking at gift horse in the mouse here. I'm going to uh, put $10,000 aside. That was gone in the first three days. So I then, uh, <laughs> I then went, went into the next lot and I purchased probably, I'm going to say five albums full of cards that were 
at that stage, even in my collection, they were exceedingly rare and unusual and had been owned by the biggest collector known to exist in Australia at the time that my, um, my friend had bought this collection from. So I managed to acquire some material that just didn't exist in other collections anywhere in Australia, known at the time. Um, and I guess over the last decade and a bit, uh, with the internet in particular, and email making the possibility of sending images to friends and acquaintances interstate overseas, etc. It's made a lot of that more transparent. So I've started to realise that some of the decisions I made then in spending that 15000 were unbelievably um, prescient in, in comparison to trying to find the same material today, which you just simply can't. And this guy had been collecting in the old days when he and his collecting colleagues from around the country and overseas were just writing to each other longhand in envelopes, putting them in the post and relying on a card that was worth $200 or $400 or $2,000 arriving from England, getting to Australia on time or going from one state to another. And also the other advantage of looking at this collection was uh, my friend said to me after it was all sorted and he had material that he was still not going to put in the shop, but he took home with him. He rang me about six months later and said, one of the tubs has just got full of notes and reference material. You can have it. So I went back and got this tub and it was just full of photocopies. I was gonna say eight to 12 inches deep, photocopies of cards that didn't exist in his collection wow. that he'd been sent from mates and friends from all around the world. So it gave me really the nucleus of a magnificent catalog. And as I said to you earlier, I've got about 35,000 digital full color images of fronts and backs of cards from the 1870s right through until the 1980s pretty much everything that's ever been produced in Australia, England, some in India, Pakistan, uh, South Africa. On the continent, there's some European countries produce career cards. And magnificently from the US, the countertop trade cards of the 19th century. A lot of them depicting cricket, as well as baseball, obviously. And famously, the old judge issues, Goodwin's old judge issues from the 19th century, their general set, set was issued in uh, 1889, a set of 75 cards for distribution with Australian cigarette packets. And that is the origins of cricket on cards in Australia. Very valuable today, a set of 15. I saw one for sale in the UK uh, about uh, three or four years ago, and they were three to 5,000 Australian dollars a card. So you're looking at 50, 60,000 for the set. Um, and I know that recently the chap who owned them passed away and his cards were purchased privately by a huge collector in the UK who would have been probably spending somewhere between 50 and 60,000 pounds to buy just that one set of cards. I have three of them. I live in hope that I'm going to get the other 12, but I don't fancy my chances. No, that's, I have so many questions based around all this, but first off, I didn't even know about old judge creating cricket cards here in the US. Uh, I know a lot of old judge between boxing cards, between baseball, and then the actors and actresses, but that's yep. news to me. Any big names from the cricket side of things in that old judge set that people might know? Well, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing from the issue point of view is they, they had an attempt earlier to produce with cricket subjects, and there were six Englishmen done. The leading figure, of course, in England in the 19th century was W.G. Grace. Yep. And his card is in the first issue of six. Um, okay. I've seen a, a mint a mint one here. And I, we don't have as much of a dependence upon grading as you do in the U.S., but this card would be graded, in my opinion, at least 95 to 96 out of 100. Um, it's exceedingly rare in magnificent condition, it resides in a collection I've, I've looked after here um, for a private client. And I rate that card as probably the Grace rookie, if you want to call it that. And I think in the right market, in the right competition, it will be a ten to $15,000 American card without question. And that for that's for a subject that's not followed by Americans traditionally, but because it's Grace and because it does represent the first English issue ever. I think that one card alone would be unbelievable to have in your collection. As I said, I know it's in one collection here. I've seen a bad one in a collection here and you'd hang on to it anyway because it's so rare. 
The next issue, the 1889-15 Australians, that's a subset of 75 personalities. I have um, three of the cricketers and 14 others from that set, and I don't know of a complete set anywhere in this country. Now, there may be a set in the US because they were produced in the US for Australian distribution, and I know that quite a few American collectors, Goodwins collectors, et cetera, will buy back the Goodwins material, and um, much of that would have been bought here and gone back home. So whether there's a person in the US has got all 15 or not, I don't know. But again, I, I think that set's probably 50 to 100,000 Australian, depending on the condition of the cards. They, they're quite thick, as in the thickness of the card. And, and I think the varnish on the surface, ultimately, with too much exposure to shrinking contraction um, cracks, and the cards are often bowed in the middle where the varnish is pulled tight. And I think you find them in great nick, almost impossible to find. Um, they're getting towards, you know, 130, 140 years old. That's not surprising. They weren't designed to last that long, I'm sure, when the manufacturers were making them. Um, so, yeah, the, the 19th century issues are magnificent. And the real, the real difficulty is when you've got a few, is finding the rest. They're, they're just so few and far between. This country hasn't had typically a long history of manufacturing and, and this sort of material really only came to pass when WD and HO Wills created a factory here in Australia in the early 20th century. And that's when cricket and then trade cards proliferated. So my friend's advice when I purchased um, a significant number of cards to me at the time was to concentrate on the pre-World War I issues in Australia with the cricket theme on them that he knew I loved. And if I could build up that collection, it would be, would pay for itself in spades eventually whenever I dispose of it. And I, I'm pleased to say now I probably have, I'm told I have the best pre-World War I Wills collection in Australia. Would occupy three albums at about 3,000 of my cards. And they're all, bar a handful, as near mint as I possibly can get them. Um, it's taken me a long time to pull them together. And I've, scoured the auction houses and the length and breadth of this country and some of the ones in the UK in more recent years looking for the odd card here and there and that's just how you grow them once you've got the bulk you have to grow them organically wow. which makes the network of people that you know really important I, I can agree with that I mean even that, like the US best way I find cards right now is going to card shows and talking to dealers and sometimes they're able to get those uh, does Australia have card shows or is it mostly yeah. card shops or what is it like over there? Retail retail typically around the world has struggled over the last probably five years and more so with COVID impacts, I'm sure. Um, but card fairs have become quite regular here. I mean, I live in a state where Aussie rules, obviously rules the roost, it emanated in Melbourne, created Australian national sport and sporting identity and the Aussie rules collectors here uh, outweigh the career collectors by 10 to 1, without doubt. But that's pretty much limited to Victoria, South Australia, and maybe Western Australia, where the code was dominant for a long time, and less so as a national sport, which has only occurred over the past couple of decades. So the, those card fairs will have a lot of Aussie rules guys there, but some of the dealers will deal in cricket material as well. And once upon a time, you could have picked a lot of that early cricket material up from next to nothing. Now it's super competitive. And, um, you know, I find myself on eBay a bit uh, looking at the UK auction houses. But because I've been doing it for 20 years and I have as a background sports research as a very much a personal interest and hobby and profession, I've always recognised that the more knowledge you have in building up your experience and your knowledge base of what's around, the greater opportunity you create to find the stuff that's that's a bit unusual and a bit rare. And um, I've certainly come across cards that others have just ignored. And I knew what made them different, what made them special, what made them stand out and was able to buy them or purchase them or swap them for next to nothing. Um, and that's a big part of, you know, the, my, Cardiophilic Society President's uh, mantra, have knowledge, it's everything. Um, you, you can't get good cards without knowledge of what's good and what's not good. You can't get the exceptional cards without, what's, without knowing what differentiates them in a set or from 
another card from the same issue. And whether it's a printing error or a, an overprint or some form of you know differential factor, and if you know that differential factor and the person next to you doesn't, then you're a chance to acquire that card in the right place at the right time. And that's happened to me so many times over the past two decades that it, I can't put it down to luck anymore. It has to be about what I know um, versus the bloke next to me who doesn't know as much as I do. So I keep thirsting for knowledge and learning about them. And I, I guess when I acquired the reference tub with all the reference material in it, to see even photocopies of cards that existed in collections 20, 30, 40 years ago, I've now come across some of those physical cards that were photocopied and swapped between people before eBay or before email or before the internet. And these were, these were you know, photocopies that were sent in an envelope from one state to another or one collector to another. And I've now seen those photocopies and physically got some of those cards that were in those photocopies from 30 or 40 years ago. Um, so that makes a that makes a nice, if you like, a tie in to the generation who collected them before me. Um, I'm also a uh, an inveterate variety collector. So if a set's got 35 cards and there's a misprint on one, I want 36 cards in my set. I figure that if my set of 35 cards came up at auction and someone else put the same 35 cards in there, but I had one more that was completely different or had an error or whatever it was, the, the real discerning buyer is gonna buy, buy my lot rather than the other bloke's lot. So I've always, I've always looked for the variations to the extent that I probably now have also the largest proof sheet subject collection related to cricket in the country because everyone else ignored these blank back cards but I kept thinking, you know, there's something special about them. I worked in the digital print industry for about six years as a operations director. And um, I realized that early doors printing, when it was linotype and, you know, full on graphic letterpress, there were lots of proof sheets at the beginning of every print run and lots of errors made. Lots of those sheets were supposed to be discarded, but a lot of them were tea leafed or thieved out of the discard bin and cut up and made into individual cards and they've been circulated like any other card would have been. So you, you sort of find those and you know that's a, another variation or another addition that's nice to add to a set that you have. Um, so yeah, I, my Wills collection is, I'm pretty proud of that. It's taken you know the better part of two decades to pull it together. I'm probably missing, I'm gonna say 15 Wills pre-World War Australian cards out of 3,000. That's amazing. And 90% of what I've, 95% of what I have is mint or near mint um, pre World War One. So that forms a, a magnificent centre of my collection. And I have other, other brands, obviously. In the UK, prior to about 1905, Ogden's cigarettes proliferated. Unfortunately, they made their cards um, with black photographic surfaces. Yep. So the, the edges show the white wear very quickly. The creases show cracks in white through the black surface very quickly. Hard to get them all in very good condition. And there's about, I think there's about 600 guinea golds and about 500 tab cards. So you're looking at about 1100 all up with cricket themes on them. I'm probably missing half a dozen, maybe 10. Uh, so that's another substantial pre-World War War subset, I suppose. And then post World War One in Australia, particularly uh, part of the war reparation was um, benevolent societies trying to make sure the community's mental health and physical well-being was looked after. And a lot of those revolved around um, redemption schemes, where you could take uh, the, cut the tabs off the bottom of the cards and take six tabs in for a loaf of bread or a dozen eggs or whatever it might have been in poorer times post-war. They're very rare because they were obviously redeemed quite regularly and the stocks of them aren't that common. So to have, you know, a substantial number of those is, again, in my opinion, a decent part of the collection. There was a set issued in 1921 of which there were 12 subjects based on the 20, 1921 Australian test team that won the Ashes 5-0 against England. And those 12 subjects are rare, a set are uh, incomplete sold on just on this weekend without tabs on them for a thousand dollars 
and I didn't think they were that good in very in terms of condition. I've got about 45 of them, including the 12 subjects. And my aim is to acquire all 12 with the tab stock still on the base. I've never seen a collection with more than two or three like that. I have five of the 12 and I'm constantly looking for the other seven because I think if you had that set, you could literally ask your own price for them, um, even in a, in a domestic market here in Australia, which doesn't typically pay over a thousand dollars for any for any individual card, but can on occasions see good sets go for big money. So yeah, that's a work in progress. And then they were issued again in the late 1920s at the onset of the depression when the same thing occurred and the country was feeling the pinch in the financial markets um, and poverty was rife across the country. So they were issued again and. That set includes 10 Englishmen. So there's 10 Australian subjects and 10 English subjects, and they're very difficult to find. I've seen some over the last couple of weeks go on eBay for 170, 180 pounds, which is about 400 Australian dollars. So when you're looking at trying to get 20 cards and you've got to pay 400 each, you're looking at you know $8,000 Australian. That's a lot of money to shell out, apart from the freight to get them here and the risk of international shipping being what it is at the moment. So yeah, they're, they're a couple of really interesting issues. I just have a love for the sport. I've got reference material behind me. Everything in the study here is cricket related um, or sport related. I, 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 go, I guess um, grew up in a family where I'm the eldest of five kids and I've got a sister who was an Olympian, still holds a national record for her event uh, some 30 years after she said it. So. I guess sport was always in our blood and relating playing to then collecting after I retired from playing, it's just been a natural progression really. But it started with my grandfather who left me a tin. No, that's, that's really, really cool on that side of things, how you progress from the tin all the way to building up the collection and how you got those reference materials. Just how you said the whole story building up to that. I mean, a lot of people see people's collections on social media and think you can build a big set or a big collection overnight. But man, it takes so many years learning all the different references, material, learning all the different players, the ins and out and everything. It's a lot of work. It's not just like, Oh, yeah. I'm going to buy the newest yeah. card that someone likes and adding it to your collection. There's so much more research behind it. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you have any, man, I, I laugh, oh, I laugh at the moment. There's a, uh, there's a site in the U S that I think uh, in the UK that I think has erroneously identified John Bradman rookie card. And uh, it's set a cat amongst the pigeons in terms of pricing for that card that I sit back and laugh about now because I think the latest one that's been online, the guy wants 1,200 Australian dollars. Three years ago, you could have bought the entire set of 35 cards for under 200 Australian dollars, including the Bradman card in it. And they all would have been near mint. But now one card out of that set selling for over 1,000. And the stupid thing is, there are people out there who are paying it to justify that existence and that price level in the market. And I just don't understand it whatsoever. So the research and the, you know, the network becomes a huge part of what makes this collection more successful because if you don't have something and you're not aware of what it is, you don't know where to look or what to look for. But if you've got someone who's got some knowledge about it, they can give you the head start on what it is, where to look for it, what you should pay for it. Um, how to house it, where you might find one, you know, and the network that you have and you develop keeps an eye out and ear out for each other. And I think that's the great way to do it. And you build up, you know, I've got mate, great mates out of doing this over the last two decades that I'll never, you know, lose their friendship and lose their mateship. We've shared knowledge and that's as much fun as you can have when you've got a beer in front of you or something like that. You're just sharing knowledge at a, a bar somewhere and having a bit of fun. So I was going to ask, you said that wasn't the true Bradman rookie. What is the true Bradman rookie? I think I know what you're talking about, though. The 1928, yeah. was it the... Yeah, Ogden's. Yeah. Ogden's, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I have a mixed view on that because whilst the English were printing cards of a substantial set nature well before Australia was, it's the image on the Ogden's card is identical to the image on an Australian card of the same vintage. Bradman debuted in 1928-9. The image that's used on the Ogden's card is identical to a Hoadley's image here on a trade card here from a Melbourne manufacturing company, a chocolate manufacturing company, with the exception that instead of 
The Alton's card has the image vertical. The Hoadley's card has him tilted. The same image. He's just tilted on a slight angle. See, exactly the same image staring out at you. And I don't think anyone could guarantee which one was done first. We don't know. Uh, the people who can help us with a lot of the production and development of these things are long since dead. You can go and talk to the likes of Select and Futura and the modern Australian issues or the modern overseas issues, Tops, etc. You can talk to those people and they can tell you what they've done or they've got records, printing records and production records. Go back into you know the 19th century stuff or the early 20th century stuff and none of that exists anymore and the people who actually did it are all dead. So if for someone to come out and, and outlandishly, in my opinion, suggest that this that the Ogden's rookie card was the rookie card for Bradman, I think is um, taking it one step too far. Um, and what it's done is artificially produced uh, a false factor in the market that some others have cashed in on clearly and selling their own. And I'm not an advocate for that at all because I think that just shuts out the average collector who wants to just try and finish that set. You know, if you were if you were collecting a set of 1950s baseball cards and you came across a Mickey Mantle that you knew you needed, but you knew there were Mickey Mantle collectors out there who only collected Mickey Mantle cards, well, that makes it impossible for you to finish your set. Because by their very nature, when they're singularly after one card and there's a group of people who are, they're going to keep outbidding each other and leave the set collector way behind in their slipstream who's trying to just finish that set by getting the last, procuring the last card. Um, and that's a shame of it. Um, hopefully that sort of interest would generate other people joining the hobby and trying to get involved. But I think in the last two decades, I've seen a general decline in new collectors taking it up. Um, with the exception of now the modern phenomenon of signed cards and patches and um, silver foil and gold foil special editions, that's probably generated another group of collectors who only look after that sort of material and really don't have much appreciation for what came before it, in my opinion. I, no, the same thing happens in the US markets where uh, everyone goes after modern refractors or autograph cards yep. and a lot of people forget about the past. And you, and at least as a collector, what I do, I try to do 80% vintage, 20% modern. So that way I can still stay up to date with what's happening today and then really collect the old stuff is that's what I enjoy the most, but I try to leverage the new stuff to try to trade for the old. And it's quite yeah. a bit of fun with that side of things. And I mean, I was tracking a lot of those Bradman prices this year. Uh, just, it's insane how much they skyrocketed. I don't know exactly what happened. And then grace, same exact thing. Like I was chasing the 96 wills grace for quite a bit. And I was getting out bid at like 200 USD for the 96 grace. And all of a sudden, like, a month, two months later, it went from two hundred dollars, like fifteen hundred dollars, and I got priced out. <laughs> luck, 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 their mutual friend Jay Sut, he gave me a beater version. I ended up paying two fifty for that one, but I, at least I have that in my collection. Eventually, one day I'm going to work towards getting a nicer example of it. But yep, man, I, I join the club. I don't <laughs> have a great one either. Yeah, and, and my pockets are like yours. They don't run deep like that. I mean, I it, it's it's interesting. The difference between the English collector and the Australian collector is that the English will have a thirst for the 1896s because it was the first real full set produced. I'm aware of some English cards that exist before that that are literally unobtainable, um, no matter what how deep your pockets are because they're so few and far between. But I often wondered why the English pay so much for that 1896 set when the cards produced by Wills were very prolific in that era, and yet they don't seem to have the same desire to pursue the Australian issues around the same time um, that, you know, bookend the great Australian collections here. Um, when they come up, those cards come up, they can sell for a song. I've built a collection of, I've got 49 of the 5896s in what I would consider good to very good condition. Grace is down, I'm missing one. And I don't think I've ever paid more than 40 pounds for any of them. And you know that Grace is going to be the signature cost. And that's okay. But like you, I'm happy to forego a great one until the opportunity presents itself. And if I've got something I could swap for it, then maybe one day that'll happen. But I'm not going to pay 200 pounds for a Grace card from a set that I don't think stands out any better or more pronounced than a few other English sets around the same vintage that are harder to find 
um, but don't seem to command the same price. And I've, I've never understood that. Um, I think you can do all the research you like, but one man's um, wish and whim can't be, you know, delved into by comparison to another's. Um, that's all you can learn about it. And some, uh, someone out there is always prepared to pay whatever it takes to get whatever they want if their desire and their pockets match above and beyond the rationale. That, that so you just have to be irrational. Honestly, that explains the modern market today when people prospect some of these guys, at least on the baseball side of things, people pay thousands and thousands of dollars for some of these modern players. Yeah, you have some of the greats of the game. You can buy sometimes. Uh, do you know who Willie Mays I mean, you have a Giants thing. Do you, have, do you know who Willie Mays is? Yep. Yeah, yep. like Willie, you can find Willie Mays rookie cards cheaper than some of these brand new autograph cards that are coming out. It makes yep. no sense because Mays is a top five player of all time. The uh, the newer player, what they have to achieve in the game of baseball to get even close to Mays' level and the odds of that happening are so slim, but people will overpay in hopes of that player becoming a next great of the game. It's, it makes no sense to me, but you know, there's a whole market based around it. I wanted to yeah. ask though, do you have any examples of some of your cards so you can kind of show on the screen so people can see them? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll give me two seconds. I've got two albums here that I got out for today. I'm going to go back and get one of the other ones. Sure. And um, I'll give you an idea of some of the rarity. So I spoke to you before about the Australian issues. So yeah, I'm curious what it looks like. This is a set not complete by any stretch of the imagination because we've subsequently found out there are more cards than what was recorded. These are from 1901. There are, they're called, they're wills, they're called blue fancy frames. And there were two, two issues, a blue set and a violet set. Violet's probably a, bit, a better colour. These cards were, they're still regarded now probably as the first real Australian set issue of note. You're looking at somewhere between Two and three hundred, four hundred dollars each in really good condition. That's difficult to get. They're, they're made in 1901, and the best collections in Australia will have no complete sets of them. I'm only aware of three or four collections in the country that have got all 25 subjects in blue and all 25 subjects in violet. The blue set is problematic because in the last six years, some colleagues and I have honed in on where they all are in the bigger collections. And we've come across printed variations at the same number that weren't previously recorded. So you, you might think you've got a set when you've got the 25 numerically numbered cards, but we find out now there's two number fives, two number ones, two number eights, and they're different subjects on each card. So some people will say they've got the set of 25, but they might have 8A, and another person might have a set of 25 with 8B but neither have both eights. So the documentation is, is gone. And as I said earlier, the people who made them are gone. We don't know whether they were separate prints or whatever. Um, so that's a, a very, very nice set of cards. I mean, they're companions, if you like. These are the no-frame issues, again, from 1901. The first page of 20, including the doctor in the bottom there. Wow. Here. Yep. The greatest card. Um, I've seen a pristine version of that sell for over 2000 on its own. Mine is nowhere near pristine, but I have it, which is a bonus because plenty of others don't. Second sheet, complete again. So the first 40 I have. The third sheet is somewhat incomplete. However, some of those have never been seen. The cards have been recorded, but the, the physically the cards never been seen. And we know of 59 in this issue, the best I've seen is a client's collection. He's got 56 of the 59 and the other three cards have not been cited in any collection to my knowledge anywhere in the country. We, we, don't, we don't know why there were 59, it seems an odd number. Um, we suspect that they were probably printed a couple of times and maybe the, the printer changed the plates and put a few modern players in. Modern, when I say modern, the next season's players in. We don't know. Yeah, so that, that becomes part of the whole research 
that you've got to do to try and find out what it is you've got, why, what's it, what's missing, is the missing uh, element actually a card that you can physically get or not? I'm going to try and find an example. So we talked before about the Ogdens, pre-war Ogdens. A subset of the Ogdens, 800 odd cards in what you would call near mint condition. Very difficult to find in, in good order because of the, the chipping on the edges. As you can see they've got black borders around some with the, so the, the white, on, white on the image. And the black borders obviously show up when they're damaged on the corners, et cetera, very quickly. Hard to collect in Great Nick, again, because they're English and we don't have too many of them out here. So to require a set of those was pretty amazing. This is probably one of my best cards. It's a 1902 F&J Smiths at English Grace in near mint condition. Uh, that card sold two weeks ago for three and a half thousand pounds online. That was one of the graces that went in the more recent uh, upsurge of cards for sale. So it's a nice one to have. I can't understand why people pay three and a half thousand pounds for it when the blue set isn't as rare as the three on the bottom. The three on the bottom are three of 16 cards. I've got no hope of collecting all 16, but unlike the blue back set, as these are, these have reds on them and they're significantly rarer. And the four great 19th century golfers, Braid, Hilton, I can't think of who the other two are now, um, the English golfers Varden. from Royal and St. Ancient. Varden? Sorry. Yes, Varden. And I, I can't think of the fourth one is, but those um, four. You have, you have Varden, you have, um, oh man, I know who the guy is. Braid, Hilton, and the other Tom one, Morris? I can't think of it. Yes, Tom Morris, Tom Morris it is. Yes, there it is. is. So those four cards in red with one variety, and there's four varieties of each card, one variety, all four, three to four years ago, 10,000 pounds for the four cards. Man, so, I, I, didn't, I didn't even know that existed for the Tom Morris, and now I don't even want to get it because I can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> I, have his, I have his 1901 Ogden. I have two of them, I think, and uh, they're lower grades, but still, I'm trying to get some more of his cards. Man. This is another, this is the end of a set of cards I have, and I don't have it with me, but the magnificent... Victor Thomas Trumper, probably Bradman's predecessor as the greatest Australian cricketer, is in this set. They're in magnificent condition, VG plus, the whole thing, all 25. The hardest card to get is the last one, Fielder. 1905 or 03 on those? 03. These are 1903. Um, but I don't, have, I, I don't have a predilection for signed cards, but my earliest signed card... I paid a fair bit for it at the time. I had the money on me. I was at a fair. This is a magnificent version of the Trumper card. But I bought the same card when a bloke offered it to me with a bit of scribble on it. But the scribble he didn't know, I knew was Trumper's autograph. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> awesome. So it's my earliest. I don't have it here. It's in my uh, other album. I've got some signed cards in another album. But that's my earliest signed card. I'm not a signed card person. I have about a hundred of them um, only. And the Trumper one clearly is the signature card in the collection. Although I do have a Jack Hobbs signature card and I have a Patsy Hendren signature card and I have a Warwick Armstrong signature card. And they were all just hand signed. There was no, you know, line up to sign a cards like you get today. Um, so they're just nice to have as inclusions. Um, Another quite unique part of the collection are these little fellas here. This is the first major Melbourne um, Australian cigarette card company, Snyder's and Abraham. They were issued in Melbourne. And that's a set of what's known as the Mauve cards. And people have always said there's a difference between Mauve, the reference guys in Australia talk about a black set, etc. No one's ever really sure when you see them whether it's just mauve gone bad, called black, or whether it's black. 
but I have, excepting, excluding the bottom row, I've built a set of black ones over time. That are one card short, and these are, I don't know anyone else who's got this many in this country. They're just, they're all jet black and they're all in fantastic condition. And uniquely, there are some that are I've kept adding to that have beautiful colours on the front, but unlike the previous two sheets I showed you, none of the backs of these cards have the printer's initials on them. Hmm. So I see that as another variety. And as I said earlier, I love varietals. <laughs> so oh. I'm... Um, I'm pursuing all 15 and I've got no, I haven't got really a long way given I've only got five. Uh, I'm always looking for them. And I know that I've bought them for nothing by comparison to what they should be worth because people are selling them as a standard Snyder's and Abraham card. And I'm, I, I know that they're different. And uh, I've learned that over time that, you know, I guess that started because my grandfather got me interested in collecting stamps when I was little. And he always talked about the difference between perforations and watermarks and, why they were important to have the different ones and to get a full suite, you needed all the varieties. So I just extended that logic into my cards, I guess. Moving from the really early stuff to a more modern one. And I'm really pleased with these because it's just, it's taken me such a long time to collect. In the US, you'll have sets that have um, been single colored. Um, and Australia in the 1950s and 40s was doing the same thing, but we, we also had some trade card companies here who issued the same set of cards with single and or multi colors. So you, you get, instead of one set of 32 cards, it could be five different colors and therefore the set's 160. Yeah, we have that. With the, we have that with the 1941 uh, Gaudis. So they did the same thing. They have four different colors based around it right before World yeah. War II. Well, this is page one That's of eight. I'm missing two now to have every single one of the 32 subjects with each of the colours in near mint condition. And they're this, from 1958. They pop a lot. They're, they're, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Um, very hard to find them in good condition, unfortunately, because they're, again, made on white stock. So whenever there's a damage or a break on the front, it shows through the colour. Um, and, you know, you often, and I guess um, I don't often do this, but there's one here, which is ironic in a way. This one's signed. The blue one here is signed. I see it, yeah. I've left it in the collection because I don't have that card in good nick outside the signed one. And the irony is that the fellow who signed it was famously called in 1958 for throwing in a test match. So there's a picture of him bowling and he signed the card. And I love that story behind it. The English, I don't think, collect in the same, at the same level of variety as we do here. Um, by comparison, they're happy to have just a set of whatever the cards are. So for instance, those 1958 cards, they're more inclined to collect the 32 subjects and the 160. So that makes this set here quite unique because they're English and they're very colourful and they were issued by ABC Gum, whose equivalent in the U US was Tops, who did a lot of the same gum series issues and a lot of the designs are the same. You're probably going to see that same sort of pattern around some of the Tops cards. Yeah. These are, these are grey on the reverse. Now uniquely, the same subjects were produced again with a white reverse, white board, white, backs. white stock. Tops. Tops always did that, the green white backs yep. throughout the 50s. But what's strange about these two is that when you line them up, They're you see the tops hanging out, the cards are different dimensions. That is so weird. It is very weird. So to have all, all of the cards in both sets is a bit unusual. Um, and I've got friends who I show them to and they go, why have you got two sets in your album? Then I talk about them and they look at them and go, oh my God, we never knew that. So I, that's, that's again, one of the reasons that my, the depth exists in my collection because I've pursued those odd production issues. There's another one here that's an English, English variety. 
And this is Popeye, the whole set of Primrose Sweet cards. Card 14, this card here, has a cricket theme on it and it says, Ahoy Wimpy, has you seen Sweet Peas Cricket Ball? And there's a picture of, you know, Wimpy with the, the belt on his head. I've got another card from the same issue, identical on the front, the bottom card here. However, when you look at the reverse, this is card 14. You see down the bottom, just above my finger, you see the spelling of Argyle. Here, can you put it up a little bit? I don't see your finger. Okay. Yep. This is, this is the second card. G Y double L. Y W R. So the first card had G Y L E, and this is G Y double L. Man, all the variations. So it's, it's a it's a variety that wasn't recorded until probably four or five years ago. Um, I picked it up because it was a photocopy of both of them, and one of the pages in that tab I got had the two cards next to each other and someone to put them on top of the photocopier and photograph the two different cards and highlighted what the difference was. And I reckon I paid nothing for the extra card. It was like two bucks or something like that, knowing what it was with no one, with the person who sold it to me not knowing. And I suppose, you know, to some extent, I took advantage of that knowledge, but that's what it's about. Um, and the last set I'll show you, probably the vanguard of the modern collecting in Australia. Hardly any cricket issues were issued in 19... The 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. And then along came um, the chewing gum cards with major impact in America in the 1960s. And the Australian market followed suit. So we produced the Scanlon's yep, I gum company this. cards. This is a near mint set of all 40, including the great Gary Sobers and the West Indians. And then about uh, 12 months ago, I was offered the opportunity of requiring them. I've got so, half, I've more than half. I've got about 32 now of the 40 with the signatures on them. That's incredible. And a lot of the subjects are now dead. So my aim in this stupid sort of mental space that exists between my ears, I suppose, is to find all 40 with the signatures on them. The set itself in very good condition would be a thousand plus two thousand dollars each uh, for the set. And a signed set, I don't know of one that exists. So to have three quarters of them signed is very it's rare incredible. and very unusual. Um, and I've I was buying some of those through the cartophilic auction with no competition whatsoever at a reserve price of ten or fifteen dollars Australian. Man, I was that's pretty happy with that. <laughs> that's great. Hey, if you ever find another 65 sobers, it's cheap. I need one. Yeah, well, I could do with a better one than mine too. Don't worry. Um, I don't think there is such a thing as a cheap 65 sobers, by the way. Because the last oh. couple I've had a go at have gone over $100 each. Ouch. I remember bidding on one a few months ago and I lost at 50. I should have just pulled the trigger there. Yeah. And I think, um, I think there's certain signature players as well that, uh, always going to out of every set, whether it be Grace or Sabres or you know whoever it is, they're always going to command a premium just because of who they are. I mean, the Grace card, any any Grace card's probably um, worth its weight in gold. Now, any Bradman card's worth its weight in gold. I've seen the the Series Twos, uh, Bradman's records now all exceeding three hundred dollars each Australian, and we don't even know how many there are in the set. We've got records of thirty. Nine, to my mind, as I said, I spent six, six years in the printing industry. To have a set of cards of 39 seems it's a very out. strange thing to do. Especially you can't set up sheets. a sheet. Yeah, you can't set up a printing sheet. Um, you, you just have to expect that there's probably something missing. Not that we've seen it. And a few colleagues and I have, you know, quite assiduously recorded everything we know. Um, and not never come across the 40th. It just makes no sense to me. And that to know that you know they're if they're worth if they're getting $300 plus each in very good condition, I'm sitting on 25 of the 30, 39, 
I'd love to last 14, but I'm not going to find them in a non-competitive market. And I'm not going to be paying $300 each for them. I just don't want to pay that sort of money for them. Um, I don't mind it, but uh, it needs to be very special. I just want to finish. This is not my actual card, but it's um, I had some done so I could share it with other people. I own what is supposedly the rarest cricket trade subject card in the world, known by one only in existence from a Melbourne company from 1901. And it's battered and knocked around. Um, it's believed to have been a salesman sample that was used by a sales rep who was trying to market some cards for the English tour of Australia in 1901-02. And I had, I had some knockoff business cards made with the image of it on it. So this is owned, this is a Melbourne shoe company called the Robert Hurst Boots and Shoe Company. And on it is the left arm orthodox spinner Colin Blythe, who was killed in World War I. There are equivalent cards to this that have the same centres and the same font around the outside, produced for the McCracken's Brewery Company, for the Wallace Tyres Company, and for the Hordens Gentlemen's Outfitters in Sydney, all of which, all four entities, had stores in Flinders Street or Flinders Lane in Melbourne in the same block. And our rationale is that this card was produced by the manufacturer for Robert Hurst Boots and Shoes as a sample to potentially produce the rest of the cards in the set with the coloured border around the outside that the other three companies have. There are no other known versions of a sample card and there are no other known versions of this card from this company in existence. The family descendant who found out I had this card after I did a talk on it and a few others uh, a few years ago here, um, sent me an offer of 5,000 UK pounds for that card. I still have it. I'm a seller. I'm not a seller, I'm a collector. So I still treasure those examples that sort of make my, I suppose, make my collection special. Um, and, this, and not just special to me, but special to friends who know I've got it or seen it. And uh, I also have seven, what you would refer to probably as carte de visites because they're too early for cigarette or trade cards. Seven cards from 1878 that feature the first tourists who went to England representing Australia or the colonies of Australia. But uniquely, the seven I've got are signed by the seven players, including the first test captain of Australia, Dave Gregory. Wow. Um, so they're absolute museum grade. And in fact, I bought them in Sydney uh, from a contact in Sydney. I was concerned as to how they were going to get to Melbourne because the postal system in this country is not very reliable, in my opinion. It's not in the, it's not in the US either. Don't worry about it. No, I know. I know. COVID is certainly a reason for some of that, but I'm not sure that's the only reason. So I, I never really quite knew what to do because I knew I'd spend quite a bit of money on these cards um, and I just really didn't know how to get them to Melbourne. Anyway, a colleague was going to Sydney as a guest of the National Rugby League and I asked him if they were in an envelope, could he bring them back? And he said, yes, provided I get the first look at them when you open the envelope. And I said, you can have a look at them before they go in the envelope. I don't care as long as I get the seven that I've paid for. Anyway, um, he got them back. We met at work where he handed them over. And he said, you know that we could put ours on display because the MCG hold 15, the 14 subjects in the museum collection. But your seven outweigh the 14 we've got. And they're the only 21 we know exist and the seven I've got assigned. So they're pretty special. And, you know, I guess over time, I've collected a few other bits and pieces along the way like that. So there you go. Wow, uh, I'm, I'm really what impressed. What else can I help you with? No, I, I, think, I think the viewers are really gonna enjoy this. I mean, I learned so much just talking to you this last hour about cricket cards. And I learned probably a month's worth of just research, maybe even more months, worth of research is looking up everything so i really appreciate you jumping on here and having the conversation do you have any social media people can follow you on um i just facebook but um i i like um i share a collecting forum with some friends in the uk uh, with a few other people here as well that um has generated a massive amount of interest because one of the guys on it is a host is a ex 
Well, we used to own a private cricket museum in England, um, and he's been posting some of the material he's held in his own collection, um, which is amazing. So on there uh, is the leading collector of ceramics, cricket-related ceramics in the world. Um, I'm probably one of the leading card collectors, I suppose, going around. Um, and there are other guys on there who specialise in, in other fields that are related to the same sport. So some have got programs, some have got photographs. Um, that's really become a fantastic thing to look at. And, I, and I've got, you know, a couple of significant collections here. One of my best friends probably owns the best trumpet collection in the world. Um, and his Bradman collection isn't far short of that either. Um, I've got another mate who, without doubt, has the best Bradman card collection in the world. Um, you're talking, and, and I don't know whether you've seen Jody Bridges' book on the Bradman card. Uh, she, she put out a book on about 250 um, pages, personally published on Bradman's cards. You can't find it for love nor money because there was only a couple of hundred copies produced. It was privately published. Whereas a friend of mine has probably just about every card in that book and some of them are breathtakingly rare and uh, known by only one or two examples in this country. Um, I suppose um, there's an interesting card on eBay at the moment. I'm watching that with bated breath to see what happens with it. It's a Hans Ebling card and it's from a tiny little Tasmanian confectionery company called Tasmanian Sugar Products. It was issued, they started it in 1934 and the research I've done on the company saw the company dissolved by the middle of 1935 so they were going for less than 18 months they only did one run of cards and it was a cricket theme based around the Ashes tour in 1934 the, the Ebling card that's online at the moment mirrors one in my collection and mirrors one I just gave to a friend in lieu of a debt but the one online the significance of it is it proves that there was at least three sheets of them produced because prior to that, we only knew of two copies of any of the cards in the set. We don't know how many cards there are. We know there's, there's only 29 physically known in the world. Nine of those reside in my collection. But I was happy because the six I got initially, I got in that first week when I uh, Went spent that collection. my sports car money. <laughs> so hey, you I've made grown, the right choice. You got a hobby for life about, now. Yeah, well, yes, I've added three to it in 15 years, which is not good going, but when there's only 29 known subjects and I've written extensively and researched extensively about them and nowhere do I know of any other cases of them that exist. And that includes talking to people who live in Hobart and have lived in Hobart all their lives and been collectors and who've never seen one, let alone known that they existed. So you're looking at, you know, the rarest of the rare and there are two Bradmans known from that set. I mean, and they're command your own price cards, really. Um, if you've got one, if you've got one of the two and you wanted to sell it, the highest bidder would have to pay five figures for that card alone, without doubt. I, I can't imagine that at auction today, especially with that Bradman yep. spike. Yep, yep. Hey, well, thanks again for doing this. I really appreciate it. And, no worries. Uh, 